So up next we have, oh, my computer is frozen, um, our panel on blockchain, IoT, and smart cities. So, so we have it with uh, John Greathouse, who is a renowned entrepreneur in the town. He is kind of a guru, one may say. He's an author <laughs> uh, and hosts a incredible speaker series every, every quarter at UCSB where he brings in um, world-class entrepreneurs to teach students about the state of entrepreneurship and tech and just amazing things. He's uh, sold sold Citrix and actually took Citrix public. Um, how much was that IPO, John? No, we sold a go to meetings. Sold a go to meetings Citrix, lots of billions. And um, yeah, so that's yeah, we didn't pay the big one. Not pay the big one, unfortunately. And uh, Dr. Bashkar Krishmanchari, who runs. Uh, the IoT lab at USC, which is an incredible lab that works with the city of LA on a lot of fascinating blockchain applications, which I hope he will talk about. Uh, Chris Ballinger, who uh, used to be the, or he currently runs Mobi, which is the Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative. He's working on putting car titles on the blockchain to more seamlessly communicate between, uh, when in, in a world of automated cars, um, they need to communicate with each other in a more trustless environment. And he will probably mention about that. And Siva, um, let's see. yeah, uh, Siva is the he runs digital. Uh, he's the CTO of the Digital Venture Group at Boston Consulting Group, um, and he is also quite interested in uh, blockchains for IoT and smart cities. So if we can put our hands together for these wonderful panelists. All right, well, thanks for hanging in with us. This is the end, and it's not the bitter end, um, I hope. No, I don't think it will be. I did get a chance, or Cameron did get a chance to introduce everyone except for Barbara. Barbara Bickman is also um, here with us today. Hi, Barbara Bickman. Hey, Barbara. She, was the co she is the co-founder and managing director at the Women's Innovation Fund Accelerator, and she's also the founder and CTO of Trading Ventures. She's going to talk about, uh, she's going to tell us a bit more about her IoT and blockchain experiences, but I will foreshadow a little bit. Um, she's been involved in IoT that has been used for energy management, and one of her blockchain initiatives that she's been involved with is with tracking sustainability. So I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about both of those. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate you coming to uh, beautiful Santa Barbara. It's usually a bit warmer, but we can't control that. My first question is to the entire panel, and I guess we can just go, we'll just go this way, and then we'll come back this way. Um, I'm curious, this is actually a selfish question because I'm frankly curious about this from these leading experts in, the, in IoT and, and blockchain. I'm curious what you folks think about the hype curve when it comes to blockchain. And just quickly for, for folks that may not be familiar with the hype curve, that's that graph you've probably seen before. Think about flying cars in 1958. They were coming in three months. That was like the top of the hype curve, peak of, peak of inflated expectations if you're a scholar. Uh, then, of course, they didn't come in three months, so then we were in the trough of disillusionment, and slowly, it's taken quite a number of decades, we're starting to see Uber and some other folks actually build what could be flying cars. So we're kind of getting to more of the uh, slope of enlightenment, or hopefully, eventually, the plateau of productivity, which is when it's a mature um, technology. So with that long preamble, I'd love to hear your thoughts on where do you think we are with, with regards to blockchain on that, cur on that curve? So uh, I don't know the names of all these different you yeah, know, parts of that curve, one, two, but I think four. <laughs> I, I, something I've been saying for really um, at least a couple of years is that being in the blockchain space is like buying a plane while it's being built. Uh, I think there is a lot more hype uh, than you know. If you actually look for real use cases, they merge. They take a lot of time to build. Uh, blockchain is actually a harder uh, technology to adapt. Uh, to different use cases, because it's not just you know, a single company that needs to make it all happen. So I, I think we have a long way to go. I think that's, I just leave it do you think? Do you think we are out of the hype? The very because I mean, if you think about three or four years ago, I think there's still some hype there. Oh, okay, yeah. so we're still somewhat on the hype curve. I think great. Yeah. What do you think? So <laughs> I would uh, add to what uh, Baskar has been saying about blockchain and the issues with the blockchain. I think that relates to where it stands in the hype cycle. Uh, the key issue with the blockchain, as everybody knows, who has been following through blockchain, is the stakeholders and the critical participants which are required to form the blockchain, to be to make blockchain an effective right. solution, for example. 
And my experience in the blockchain world with the enterprises has been uh, started off with a healthcare blockchain and then a supply chain blockchain. So anything which is related to prominence or tracking, I, I see there is much more, uh, I would say it has gone past the hype. I would say at least the people have started to see that there is something which you can do with the blockchain. Mm -hmm. On the other side, for example, with the IoT, for example, the panel which you're talking about, I see that it's still in the innovation uh, scale, primarily because of some of the challenges which still need to be resolved uh, from a technology standpoint as well to yep. scale it. Right. Uh, so it's, it's a bit more earlier. So I think depending upon the applications and depending upon the industries, there are different uh, places in the diet cycle, which I would say. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, and it's interesting, to, do you want to give your thoughts on IoT as well? It's interesting to compare those two on where, because I, I, I think about the press with Pebble, that watch from years ago, and IoT was going to be, you know, again, three months away, and then obviously it wasn't. I mean, my take on IoT is that we are kind of in a, um, you know, bit of a um, down cycle, and that's because, again, in a, in a very real way, I think IoT really makes sense when you have a whole economy around it and you don't have the entire end-to-end -end application from the deployment of the sensors to the collection and you know, movement of the data to the analytics and the application that you build on it. Um, kind of the first generation of IoT has tried to take all of that in-house within one company or organization trying to build it out. And I think um, it's not going to scale that way. And so some of our efforts, which I'll hopefully uh, get to talk about or are trying to address that question. So I think we're kind of in a local optima even with, with IoT, just the and wrong model in some sense. It's interesting you say that, and I do want to hear about some of your initiatives. That when I think back to the internet, back I'm old enough that I was involved in the internet back in the early days, we had to build the credit card processing, we had to, we had to build all those tools that now you can get for free on GitHub, right? Um, so it's kind of similar in that regard. It wasn't that it was impossible to sell things online in 99, it was just really, really hard and inefficient and, and we had a long way to go. And it just takes some time. Yeah. Barbara, what are your thoughts on, you can talk about blockchain and IoT and kind of where they might compare. So where are we on the blockchain hype cycle? I think there's still some hype, but I actually also think that there's actually more, at least I see, a far more amount of people trying to understand how to create pr more practical use cases for blockchain. Uh, not only in the IoT space, but just across many spaces. I mean, everyone knows about supply chain, that's one. I've, I've heard of logistics, I'm seeing, starting to see a lot more telecom. I mean, I'm doing smart cities, I'm doing a lot more in the sustainability, so that could be carbon trading, it could be, you know, how are you going to preserve water, how are you, you know, there's, there's many, many other more practical use cases of the blockchain I'm starting to see. So I think the hype cycle is going a little bit down for that, and people are actually realizing that, that there are some good, good uses of it, uses based on the, you know, blockchain still have limitations, based on inside of limitations of blockchain. Mm -hmm. IoT, I mean, I've worked on IoT for many years. Uber started out as an IoT company. They claimed that they were an IoT company. They didn't come out as Uber in the beginning. So, I mean, IoT, I don't know why that hasn't crossed the chasm 100%. Um, I agree with you, Bashkar, as far as, like, you need an economic engine around it. It can't just be, like, data for data sake, or uh, um, a lot of people are using IoT just technology for technology sake. I think there has to be a combination of that and an economic value in order for it to really be moved forward. Because we're talking about adopting things in cities or in massive, massive areas, but that's not gonna happen without an economic value to it. Right, absolutely. So uh, I, I think we're, uh, well past the, the hype of 2017 when you could go out with a white paper and raise 10, 20, 30 million dollars. Those are the days. Uh, and that's healthy. Uh, <laughs> uh, most of our members are big companies. Uh, I think that what you've seen uh, through that hype cycle is that quietly, sort of under the surface, uh, companies have been getting more involved, big companies have been devoting more resources, understanding the technology, uh, more of the plumbing is being built. Uh, to the point that I, I actually think we're, we're close to the cusp of uh, the, the first widely adopted solution where the blockchain is in the background uh, rather than being in the forefront as, as the product itself. And we'll 
we'll get, that was good foreshadowing as well. We'll get the answer to what that technology is in a minute. Barbara, I have a question specific um, for you. So Trade Adventures, as I mentioned, has a women's innovation um, fund accelerator, right? You're helping startups all the way through the maturation process, as I understand it. We're the in Women's Innovation Fund and Accelerator. And Accelerator. We're and Accelerator. Oh, anyway, sorry. there's a reason why that's not an and there, but okay. we won't get into that. Well, we can. <laughs> I, I, I'm curious as to, um, and just for the folks out here, what one thing they're doing is trying to take startups all the way through that from due diligence, if they're, if they're being um, looked at for funding, all the way through to sustainability? So, so what we do is, um, we kind of do three things in that fund. We're an opportunity zone venture fund. So we have to have a real estate component. So we're using co-working and acceleration in order to um, help advance tech companies. So we look at blockchain, AI, AR, and IoT companies, and some combination of the three or four or five or whatever acronyms or deep tech, or whatever they call it this week. Mm -hmm. Many different acronyms for that. Um, so that's one pillar. You have two more pillars. One pillar is that you have to have an equal amount of men and women at the sea level. You can have a few more women than men. We won't take all women, we won't take all men. We'll balance you out. We have gender balance sea level. The third thing we look for is um, sustainability. So we actually are using sustainability models in order to monetize our fund. So the companies have to be sustainable, we are sustainable, we are creating intellectual property around sustainability inside of our fund um, to make it very attractive to those uh, kind of longer term investors. Because it is kind of, and we have to, because we're doing the tax advantage portions of it, um, we kind of had to differentiate ourselves that way and make ourselves unique. So that's the fund. If you don't mind, let me rip off on one thing you said. I'm involved in a local diversity and inclusion project here in Santa Barbara. And one thing we struggled with is, or struggling with, is how do we measure impact? So the first step is sort of, as you identified, like how many folks are, do we have from underrepresented groups? Have you guys explored that? Like how do you then, then uh, go beyond the numbers and look at what impact the folks are having a chance to make at a company? As far as what? To, to measure diversity and inclusion beyond, okay, you have half women and half men. You know, going maybe beyond that. Like their economic impact, their sustainable impact. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're investing in companies. So um, all statistics are proving that if you have a balanced sea level, um, your company is more profitable. Like Kaufman just came out, the Kaufman Foundation just came out with a huge, huge study. Like if you have one woman on your sea level, you're going to raise more money. You're going to get further. Your culture is going to be better. Like IDC had a huge uh, study come out. So like all the statistics around uh, diversity and inclusion. I don't know what you want to call that. I don't. I don't think of it that way. But the you know the, all the statistics are starting to come out to prove that you know you you need to kind of balance it out. The reason why we did the fund the way we did is because we said in order to make the next generation investor and board members. Um, we have to power these types of companies, and they can be underserved, and they can be underrepresented, and that's across many spectrums, because we look at underserved and underrepresented. And that could be women, that could be, you know, people of color, that could be other diverse people. So that's what we look at. That's, that's how we look at it. Um, and so that's, that's part of the impetus of the fund itself, is to make sure, like, hey, we're making the next generation investors, mm -hmm. so they can go and power the next company. Right. That's so, why you have to have an equal amount of men and women at the sea level, because that's how we want to change it. Right, yeah, sea level, then maybe they're sitting on boards, and then maybe they're running funds and investing in, in startups, or the next generation of companies. That's the purpose. Yeah. But you can't do that if they're not represented. Right, right. At that level. They right. have to be at the sea level, because when you could then say, because I just came from a board thing yesterday, hey, you need to be able to have CEO experience, you need to have this other kind of experience, you need to have governance experience, you need, you know, so, um, and then to run funds, you know, they want you to have experience in certain things, so that's why we're doing it. Yeah, good for you. It's a great initiative. Oscar, I have a question for you about the um, initiative you have in Los Angeles. So, one of your team's goals is to partner with governments, industry players, and universities. I, I want to hear a little bit more about your partnership with the city of Los Angeles, and then also, how might it be extensible to other cities around the country? Sure. Um, so this is an effort we call I3. It stands for Intelligent IoT Integrator. And uh, so the motivation is uh, what I was alluding to earlier, where typically today when people think about an IoT solution, 
they have one very specific application in mind. So in the context of cities, it might be uh, maybe an idea for monitoring air pollution or traffic or the condition of roads. Um, and so typically you would see a vendor develop this idea and walk up to the city and say, hey, I'd like to sell you a solution. Now think about this for a second. The county of LA has about 88 cities. The city of LA has upwards of 20, 30 agencies and departments. Which one of those doors are you going to knock on? And uh, when you do, they'll get excited and they'll say, great, let's do a proof of concept. You'll do the proof of concept. And then you'll say, you know, that went great. Let's, let's go ahead and implement the solution. And then you encounter as a company that there is no actual buyer for this technology. Yeah. And if they, even if they did buy it, let's say they said, this is a great solution that's incorporated, pretty soon you've got 20, 30 different agencies with their own IoT solutions for their own particular uh, capability, none of which talk to each other. They're all locked up in their own data silos. Um, they can talk with systems that other cities within the same county have adopted, and let alone you know, outside, outside that area. So the I3 effort uh, recognizes at the start that it is helpful to think architecturally about IoT in the way that we've thought about the internet. The reason the internet has been around for 40, 50 years is this notion that IP, this protocol, can run on all kinds of networks, and all kinds of applications can run on top of IP. And by decoupling networks from applications, over time, new networks can show up, like 5G can show up, and it doesn't have to break the internet. New applications for the use of the internet can show up, and that doesn't break the internet. We have social media today that we didn't have in the 60s and 70s. Right? So in the same way, for IoT, we have to decouple data from the uses of the data. And I3, in particular, we're building an open source middleware to be launched uh, and uh, released next month which will allow cities to essentially operate a data marketplace where different vendors can come and plug in their data streams and get incentive and get paid for the use of that data by application developers. And application developers, in turn, have a one-stop shop to come to a city and say, these are all the existing sources of data that we can have to build our application. And just to give you one concrete example, let's say you wanted to build a parking app for the city of LA. You would have parking data from the city meters, you'd get parking data in private garage owners, there'd be streets where there is no metered parking, but maybe somebody has a camera pointed at it that you could run through a machine learning algorithm and infer when spots are available. So all of these different sources of data, do they, you know, each one of them can go off and build a parking application, but having a common place where all of them can provide that data, where they can manage their data sources and can, um, basically ask the application developers to give them an incentive to share their data. Uh, and we think that's the way to really build IoT systems. So that's the effort we're working on. And that requires collaboration with cities and counties, with um, not just the government, government partners, but with the industry uh, across you know, that entire range from data providers to data uh, communication and network uh, uh, companies, as well as application developers. Right? So we think that's the way in which we will progress as we create real economies around data. Mm -hmm. I, I really like that idea because as a startup person in my past, I stayed away from selling to the government because it was just so hard. Um, and so, you know, if, if other people are like-minded like me, they're, you know, these are the newer technologies that are coming out, but they just don't have the time, effort, energy, resources, whatever, to, to make it through the bureaucracy. So it's great that you guys are sort of, you know, like I guess breaking the wind for them a little bit and, and pointing them in the right directions. Right, and, and the hope is that it, it would also become standardized. If you can provide a solution that works with City A, the same solution mm -hmm. adopted by City B makes it easier for you right. to sell the same products again. So you don't have to reinvent everything each time. Do you already have another city identified? We do. So within I3, in addition to the City of LA, we have other local cities like the City of Long Beach mm -hmm. um, that's involved with it. Uh, we have uh, conversations with people at City of Pasadena and, and several others. Mm -hmm. Nice. Steve, I want to talk a little bit about what some of your initiatives. So BC, uh, BCG Digital Ventures is focused on fusing corporate and startup worlds, which I find intriguing. How, tell us what that means in terms of when you're seeking out IoT or smart or, or blockchain technologies for smart cities. Like, is there a specific kind of filter or lens that you put on those opportunities? Hmm. So uh, maybe I'll give a like a quick uh, uh, thirty seconds intro of what yes. Digital Ventures is, so that we will help frame the answer. Digital Ventures is essentially trying to work with corporates like all the top Fortune 100 or Fortune 500 clients and essentially build startups for them. Like we are trying to help them innovate uh, because of huge enterprises with all the uh, 
challenges with a big enterprise, it becomes difficult for them to innovate. So we come there, we work with them, and we also partner with the classic BCG. Like Digital Ventures is an arm of BCG, where we are essentially people who are experienced in startups and also from big enterprises. So my experience is like first uh, many years I was in big enterprise, last six years in IoT startup and blockchain startup. So essentially that's the, uh, that's the kind of people in digital ventures. So we go there, we try to understand the frictions of that corporate and we try to enable them to innovate. So we look at the market, we look at the uh, landscape and see what areas they can innovate. And some of the key areas from a technology standpoint we look at are all the deep tech which Barbara was talking about, AI, IoT and blockchain. Uh, some of the use cases, uh, some of the ventures which you have built uh, using IoT and blockchain, for example, uh, one is we built a venture called Tracer. Uh, this is for the provenance of diamonds. Uh, this is with De Beers. Uh, so this is a venture which is out in public. And uh, likewise, we are also working with an energy company uh, to basically decentralize the energy and basically help create a marketplace for buyers and sellers of energy, for example. Uh, the number, the use cases would depend upon the, the enterprise which you're working with, uh, but essentially we try to bring in, uh, we don't try to create new platforms and new protocols, we try to leverage uh, the advancements happening in the technology space across various technologies and essentially build those products for them or ventures as well. Like it's not just the product, but also a business which gets spun off independently. Okay, so you, you would help them identify what's out there and then recommend certain technologies that could benefit them. And then you're not, just, my understanding was you were identifying startups for them to partner with or acquire, but you're, you're actually taking some of that core technology and, help, and building tools for the larger companies. Absolutely. Ah, okay. And it's essentially, uh, so there are three uh, key parts of this uh, equation. One is the DV team, which is essentially trying to innovate, help them innovate. Mm -hmm. You leverage the assets from the corporate as well. There is a humongous amount of assets which they are sitting on, which they don't know, like the data side, the relationships, their partners, and so on and so forth. Yep. So we leverage that as well. And then the market understanding from the classic BCG, because uh, they understand the market uh, like any strategic uh, totally. management firm, for example. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Sounds like a perfect pairing of all of the, these different resources. I can see the corporations, the innovators dilemma, like, but we just keep doing the same thing over and over again. We know eventually that's not going to work. What yeah. do we do next? Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Chris, I want to hear a little bit more about Moby. Um, so like, quickly, it's a, and correct me if I misstate here, but it's a consortium of blockchain innovation in the, in the mobility industry. You have 80% of the global auto manufacturers as part of your, and maybe it's higher now. Uh, 70 to 80% of the global 70 ones. to 80, we'll go with 80. We'll round up. I mean, there's, there's a lot of big companies involved. So, and, and with your prior experience at, at Toyota, I'd love to hear your your thoughts on IoT and blockchain technologies. How are they going to impact what we consider today to be a car? Like we have a certain definition of an automobile, but how is that definition going to be different in the future? Okay, I could, I could go on for hours about this, but I'll sorry, give you my elevator speech. Uh, so, so uh, the first thing to note is is cars are becoming nodes on the IoT. Uh, they're, they're connected either through native connections or through phones. Uh, increasingly through native connections and increasingly through fast native connections, eventually it will be 5G, number one. Uh, number two is if something is a node on the IoT, uh, you can turn it, it can change it from a product into a service. You can rent it out, lease it, use just as much of you, as you want of it in the, you know, what's called the sharing economy, but it really is the renting economy. Uh, if you can do that, then you uh, can ask, well, what, what uh, do you need uh, in order to uh, to realize that vision, uh, and you probably need some way of making micropayments, uh, and uh, and you, you probably need uh, some sort of, uh, of of an app to connect the the services to the providers and the infrastructure. So what we're trying to do in Mobi is create a community large enough uh, so that the scale problem is solved. We think the, uh, the the real problem with 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 blockchain and IoT is not the technology. It's relatively easy to put something on a chain. Uh, what's hard is doing something with it, getting to scale. Uh, it really, we think it is about the size of the community. And so we have uh, most of the world's large automakers. We have large NGOs like the World Economic Forum. We have the Ministry of Transport and Communication and People's Republic of China uh, and tons and tons of startups so, and, and universities. And uh, so we, we think we have the ready-made community. 
There's uh, 1.4 billion cars in the world. Probably if you add in three wheelers and two wheelers, you're well over two billion. Uh, so we think we have the devices uh, and we're building the app and the, and the tokens, which is a stable coin, uh, specifically designed for uh, vehicle to infrastructure and vehicle to vehicle payments. So do you see the, and I may be completely mishearing you, but do you see a world where people aren't owning cars and they're just using, they're just renting them as they need the usage? Well, that probably a long time in the future, but I think there, there is a relatively rapid transition to uh, usage-based consumption of mobility, yes. So if a shared, so I, I, I'm an owner of a car, but I'm sharing that usage with folks that don't own cars? Is that, is that what you envision? I think, I think there's all kinds of business models here. Uh, renting out the empty seat in your car as you travel, uh, I think that's going to become possible because the cost of doing that has fallen, just like the cost of renting out the empty bedroom through Airbnb right. has fallen. I think the uh, putting your car up for rent when you're not using it, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing is one. But I also think there's all sorts of fleet models uh, where other people are going to be owning the asset and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and renting it out. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, car sharing and ride sharing converge when you have autonomous vehicles. As you, you know, as you say, with, do you want to talk a second about that? So when that convergence happens, how is the world going to be different? How are we going to, how's our thought about what a car is going to be different? Yeah, I think the, the um, with, with, with autonomous vehicles, uh, you, you really, well first, first uh, I, I think uh, true autonomy, level five autonomy in a city as difficult as, as Cairo or New Delhi or Hanoi is probably a long way away. <laughs> but I think there's a, 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 an autonomy, uh, a vehicle autonomy that's coming relatively soon that is underappreciated. And that's the, uh, the autonomous payments. The ability of, the, of a, to put a wallet in a car, tokens in a car, and have that car pay as you go mm. for the infrastructure it consumes for, the, uh, for uh, buying and selling data out of the car to create uh, 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 maps or in a, a local environment that can be shared among vehicles. Uh, that can be done uh, relatively quickly. Why? Because putting a profit function in the car is basically a sophomore level calculus. It's not the, hard, the world's hardest AI problem. It's a much, much easier problem. But it will be equally revolutionary. Why? Because uh, if you can uh, take a, a wallet, put it in the car, you can pay for infrastructure as you go. Today, we have a huge problem with infrastructure. You hear stories every week about crumbling infrastructure, the infrastructure deficit. Right? Uh, if you can pay for infrastructure as you go, you can replace the gas tax, which is going to be a disappearing right. source of revenue anyway. Uh, you can free up uh, trillions of dollars in stranded capital in the world, uh, capital investment by, by cities, and solve uh, lots of problems related to infrastructure being a public good. And most importantly, you can create tools for city managers through micro-tolling within cities for infrastructure to manage demand in the network, congestion pricing, pollution pricing, carbon pricing. These are things that are going to have really big impact in, in a relatively near term and easy to do. Well, I see anything that can get rid of the regressive gas tax is a good thing. It hurts people that can't afford it the most. People that have to drive to work and don't get paid a lot to go to work. And so it would be good to see that, that tax go away or at least um, be less of or, or at least use the gas tax is an extremely blunt instrument. It yeah. doesn't really incentivize good behavior at all or right. only in the bluntest ways. What you really want is something that you can micro toll with uh, great incentives in real time to get people to carpool take public transportation, take other routes, avoid uh, heavy commute hours, uh, right. those kinds of things. Yep. Uh, I have another question for the panel, and, and I think I'm going to start with Bhaskar because you, you have a lot of experience with smart cities. I'm curious to think about, to hear your thoughts on the IoT connectivity, how that's going to alter the daily, daily lives of future urban dwellers. So this would be a city with infrastructure as Wi-Fi connectivity. Um, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts on how entrepreneurs can get ahead of those opportunities right now. Like what should uh, what are the opportunities and what should entrepreneurs be doing to, to put themselves in the right place to take advantage of those opportunities? And we'll just go down the line if that's okay. I think you know, in terms of connectivity, the, uh, the development of 5G and deployment of 5G in urban environments with increased support for higher density of devices, uh, it's, going to be a game, it's going to be a game changer um, because today's wireless networks um, uh, cellular networks are, are largely kind of a leftover from the era where all the devices we're connecting to cellular have a person holding it. And so if you go from that model to one where the ratio of devices to humans goes to 10 to 1, 100 to 1, and beyond, uh, then you know having that connectivity is going to 
play a, a big role. Um, so in, in terms of the applications that will emerge, I think ultimately it's going to be about what value do they provide to citizens, um, whether or not it's the city that's thinking about it or other entrepreneurs that find ways to provide that value. I think that's, that's the real question. So, you know, just like with any other technology, the more you can figure out ways in which you can make people's lives easier, more convenient, more comfortable, more, more healthy, you give them something that they don't currently have uh, that is now accessible because of the sensing capabilities, the actuation capabilities, uh, the greater ability to analyze the data that comes from these sensors uh, and act on it in real time. I think th all of those possibilities that technology affords ultimately for entrepreneurs, it's this is the time to be thinking about if you, let's say you could think five years from now, the bandwidth is available, the sensing capability really is already there, edge computing shows up, um, you know, and machine learning, even in its present form, is fairly powerful. So take the technology as a given, but start thinking about what are the problems that you could address with this technology, if not today in three to five years. I think that, that makes for some really, um, uh, at least a good starting point to, to build that product market fit. I, makes total sense. I often tell my students, try, you know, if, you, if you're trying to figure out what, you're, what, what business you should go into, find a problem you're passionate about solving. And oftentimes it's a problem that's a personal problem. Right. I mean, and my, my take is that at this point, we're increasingly less limited by the technology. And so I think you could project ahead a little bit and just focus on what is the problem you're going to solve? And is it real? And will it really fit uh, people's needs? Right. And if, you can, if you're really smart, you can look around the corner and figure out what are the problems that are going to be caused by the next solutions. I mean, I'm not smart enough to do that, but some people are. Sibu, do you have any thoughts on, on what, that's, what the IoT smart city is going to look like? Yeah, I, I would say uh, almost a similar approach. Like, it's, it's more on the, the problem and the frictions you're trying to solve. And one of the key things, like as an entrepreneur, which you'll probably look at is like whenever you're coming up with a new concept or a new idea or a new product, one question which you want to ask or answer is why now? Like why is it important that it's now? Why is it the right time right now? Right. And to just uh, add to what uh, Basco was saying, in terms of the technology, what the technology offers, like we know all the technologies have all starting from let's say mainframes to PCs to mobility and then to the cloud and now it's ubiquitous, like you have cloud, you have fog, you have edge, any, the processing power can reside anywhere and everywhere. So the, uh, the feasibility and the possibilities of the technology have become endless. So I would rather think a technology as most as an enabler, like to see how, I, how IoT plays in, how blockchain plays in, for example, on the privacy side and on the monetization side. Uh, but essentially, it's all about what specific frictions or problems you're trying to solve for the community. It could start as, as simple as on the on the mobility side. It could start as simple as from the utilities which the uh, city is providing, or the day-to-day -day operations of the city, the accounting operations in the city, the identities of the citizens. There could be n number of use cases, but it's all about where do you start and how do you start and how to get the mass adoption and make sure that each and every person as part of the community is incentivized in as part of this transformation. Otherwise, it's much more difficult to get everybody on board. Right. Yeah, and I think embedded in what, what you said is it's important too that it's a problem that people are willing to pay for. Because there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of problems I'd like to solve in my life, but I'm not necessarily willing to pay all that much for that solution. And that may be where a city come into play, right? Maybe a, maybe a government municipality can say, well, we'll pay for it or we'll subsidize the payment for it. Right, and at the same time, also thinking through these incentive mechanisms, and, and um, Chris alluded to uh, congestion pricing and so on. That's, those are examples of cities thinking about problems they want solved and solutions that involve economic incentives. Um, so I think there are entrepreneurial opportunities there to help cities kind of build out solutions that have these types of incentive mechanisms in place. Right. Uh, that meet their policy objectives. Absolutely. Barbara, I don't know if we, if, I think what I'm gonna do is ask you specific questions. I think we got a pretty fulfilling answer um, already on my, my last question for the panel. I'd like to hear your thoughts on- Well, no, I'm actually what, doing a lot of smart city like and IoT area. I'm literally building these things like, as, not as we speak, but I am working on these like as practical things. Like this is part of what Trailman does. Okay. So, what, so what is your view of uh, the city of the future? How is IoT going to change it? So if you look at the combination of IoT and the blockchain in a smart city environment, um, you have to ask yourself, you know, not only how do you incentivize people, because you're going to have to change people's behavior 
but should people be the incentivization? Like, should, should we as people be giving the city now permission? Should we be incentivizing the city? Is this a place where we want to be? Versus, I want to be in a place, and therefore, I need to um, give this place something. You know, like, this place is giving me something. It's kind of the reverse thinking. So in creating, I've been creating some decentralized um, autonomous cities on blockchains and working with smart cities and then also working with uh, sustainability, carbon reduction. And so how do you go about thinking about government? Who is the government of that? Do you want to have a traditional mayor? Do you want to have a traditional, or are you going to become the government now? And then, how do you want to give your data to the devices? So we have the small scale OA people here. Um, they talk a lot about how do you put your data in for, um, for oceans and for, for those types of things, but how do I want my government using my data? How do I vote? What does a vote mean? How do I utilize energy? How is the government or the city or my decentralized area going to track me track what I use, track how I use. And so this car thing, I love, by the way, I love connected cars, that's my other kind of space. But, um, you know, how, how does car, how do cars work? How do I interact with cars? Like there's so many things as far as a smart city, and if you add a blockchain in there, you have to think about the decentralization of what does governance of, a, of an area now mean? Because it goes beyond just the tech pieces. Now you're, you're looking at who really is in control of this. And so it kind of goes beyond just the traditional structures as well. So how are you seeing the constituents you're working with? How are they leaning? Are they leaning more towards we don't want this in the hands of our local government? Well, I mean, you have to work with uh, a couple of these places or countries. So you have, you know, you have to work with in the structures of the countries. But then these are private entities building these cities. So it's kind of like private-public partnerships. So how do you balance that out? Is really the question. Because you know, if you're looking in the in the world right now, everybody, and I mean, pretty, not, not us, but pretty much everywhere else on the planet, rioting, burning, fire. So people are ready to take back their own sovereignty. So what does that mean moving forward? So it sounds like the paradigm of what we're, because it's kind of like the question I asked Chris about the paradigm of a car, even the paradigm of a city and maybe citizens involved in that city is gonna be impacted by, it's already being impacted by these technologies. So the old style, I'll live every two years and maybe go to a city council meeting once in my life. I'm sorry, what did you say? I said indirectly, yeah. yeah. Chris, did you want to add to that? The, the idea of IoT and cities and health and what opportunities it might be for entrepreneurs? I, I, I wanted to um, I just briefly mention the role of, of, of trust with, uh, with IoT and, and blockchain. Uh, the, the number of devices, right, as Basco mentioned, is, is growing exponentially, right? There's about three, three times as many devices, as pe connected devices as people already. Uh, that number is doubling every two or three years. Uh, so uh, we, we soon will have just an overwhelming number of devices. The, the, there's a great cartoon, um, it's from the New Yorker magazine, you've probably all seen it because it's the most reproduced cartoon in the New Yorker's history. Two dogs sitting in front of a computer screen and one saying to the other, on the internet nobody knows you're a dog. Uh, on the, in, the, in the IoT world, right, this problem is gonna get much, much worse because of the number of devices. Identity, every, every device needs to have an identity and every device needs to have a way of transacting securely with every other device. We already have an internet, uh, this, this lack of identity is kind of the original sin of the internet. Um, we, we already have an internet where 60% of the traffic is bots and 60% of, 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 of that traffic is malicious. Uh, we, we, we've gotten pretty good as humans of figuring out that the Nigerian prince, right, really doesn't want to pay us a million dollars to arrange a simple cross-border transfer, right? Uh, but machines, IoT devices, aren't going to have that knowledge. Uh, they're going to have to have, and, and the, the AIs uh, that, are, that are out there are going to be very good at trying to fool other AIs. Uh, there's going to be a war. And so this issue of, of identities, uh, secure identities, secure payments is, is going to be really important in our smart cities. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Bhaskar was saying the old days of, you know, six months ago, every, 
the phone had an owner, right? I mean, there was a unique number on that phone, and we could probably figure out, unless it was a burner or whatever, but most people. And you're right, with those um, devices, who owns that device? Like, how, trying to track back the, quote, ownership of the device is going to be impossible. So we, we're almost out of time, but I want to, I want to, I have about 200 more questions. We're not going to get to them. But I want to give the audience a chance. Do you have a question or two? Is there someone that wants to delve into these brains here? All right, we've got one right here in the front row. Um, thank you again for um, all your um, knowledge here. I just wanted to ask, um, uh, uh, Chris, um, you were alluding to um, a project that is going to bring about mass adoption. Is that something that you're allowed to spring on us? Uh, yeah, so um, we, we uh, if, if we actually go to YouTube and, and uh, uh, look up uh, tokens, car wallets, and the new economy of movement, you can see a three-minute video about our our our, um, our vision, uh, but we are we, we do have a a, a, a mobility app. Uh, Steve and I experimented. We downloaded it and experimented with it on the car on the way here. Uh, we have a, a, a stable token that's uh, that uh, we are working on. Uh, Baskar is an advisor to our project, um, at, along with uh, many many other uh, really stellar uh, IoT and and uh, and token designers. So yeah, we're in the in the, in the early stages of, of getting that going. I think we have time for at least one more question. I think I saw another hand. So we, uh, you guys talked a lot about transportation. Um, I'm interested in the intersection with healthcare and transportation as well, especially in terms of like ambulances. So in terms of all this technology, are you seeing any type of emerging technologies where healthcare and transportation intersect in regards to cities? Healthcare and transportation, you're asking? I, I have not personally seen anything to that effect. Well, maybe I did at the start of weekend. That was kind of a healthcare, transportation, IoT, but no blockchain. So I haven't seen that part of it. There was like a, I don't know how far I got, but it was like where uh, Uber was looking at, you know, transporting people to and from their appointments, um, that kind of like distributed way of getting around. Mm. Have you heard anything about that? Uh, I, well, okay, I, I did, I was talking to a company that was doing that for like, if you had plastic surgery, like if you had plastic surgery or you had some other kind of surgery, and you had to go to like a rehabilitation center, they were providing that whole transportation, but they were like, they had the whole stack. So they had the transport, they had the, the actual like, I'm gonna book you in a hotel, I'm gonna book you at this other place. They, they kind of had the whole entire area. They didn't just have the transport piece by itself. Cause like if you had a surgery, you kind of also need a place to stay. So they, they kind of did that for higher end clients. It's just like you have a personal interest in this. Well, I have a, Deep interest in healthcare. It's okay if you do. Yeah. If you want to talk to me afterwards, I know somebody senior to Uber. I'm happy to maybe try to make a connection or something. If you want. Great. All right. Well, let's thank Baskar, Siva, Barbara, and Chris. Thank you. Thank you.